Well, thank you very, very much for this kind introduction. I, I really was pleased to get this uh, invitation. I think many of us in the English speaking, English speaking anthropology realize how ignorant we are of um, German anthropology, and I think probably how much we've lost by not uh, paying more attention to some of the work that has been done. Uh, especially uh, in the first part of the 20th century. These lectures are going to be about religion and not about religion. They're not going to be about religion in, this, in English, or for that matter in French or German. The word can only evoke phenomena which are quite specific to certain institutions and attitudes more or less those linked with the Abrahamic religions. These are found in certain places and certain countries that are probably not more than 2,000 years old. And since I'm not a historian, I shall not be exploring the changes in nature of these specific manifestations. Rather, as an anthropologist, I seek to understand much more general characteristics Something that is as recent as religion in the English sense is not and should not be assumed to be a constitutive feature um, of human beings as such. After all, our species has been around in its modern form for 150,000 years at the very least. In fact, the problem of talking about religion in general is even worse. As has been pointed out by a number of recent and not so recent writers, even in Europe, the, world, the word religion has never stopped changing meaning. It would be quite reasonable to argue that religion, in terms of what the word evokes for most people, is barely a hundred years old. The notion of an anthropology of religion, therefore, is a non-starter to me. However, since I have no choice but to speak English, and I can't speak German, uh, I will have to use the word, but just as a device to help me communicate what I'm trying to say. I do not, unfortunately, have the luxury of inventing the language for these lectures. So, as the word religion only has meaning in specific historical contexts, and there is no point in saying what is, there is no point in saying what is or is not religious. But there is no point in defining religion as become fairly familiar in anthropology, though not necessarily for the wider public. British schools, for example, see nothing problematic in teaching their pupils comparative religion. Because of this, there's some possible misunderstanding that may be worth removing right from the first. The English word religion, in its current usage, evokes the centrality of belief in supernatural entities, fundamental values, morality, but as has been argued by many anthropologists, this emphasis on belief or credence in the existence of being that can be usefully be qualified as supernatural or linking these to morality are all features which are far from typical of the kind of thing that anthropologists have called religion. In fact, most anthropologists, I think, have given up the attempt to say what religion in general is, and so have I. In any case, this is not what I want to talk about in these lectures. What I will try to argue is that the various phenomena that we are tempted to call religious are merely some local, historical, specific manifestations of much more fundamental characteristics of our species. What these fundamental characteristics are will form the ground of my argument. 
these are phenomena that nobody would, that these include phenomena that nobody would ever dream of calling religion. I shall thus explain the more familiar religious manifestations by sort of going behind religion, since the basic phenomena I have in mind include many things that any of the usual usages of the word would never include. I shall argue, as in the title of these lectures, that the things which have been called religion a very much, with no unity, are merely historically specific manifestations of a distinctive and unique aspects of human social organization that we find in no other species. Of course, I shall not, as some writers from cognitive science attempted to do, pretend that these general features, which underlie <coughs> religious-like phenomena, are sufficient explanations of any particular manifestations. And I shall not minimize the significance of these specific, of the specific developments that have created religion out of the more general features with which I shall begin these lectures. Indeed, I shall concentrate on some of these developments in the last three lectures, and I can even hope that the very general account of the type I propose will throw some light on spe specific localized questions which are very relevant to the world we live in. For example, the very vexed question why many people caught up in the Abrahamic religions uh, seem so often to consider themselves under siege and to feel the need to defend their institutions at all costs. However, before turning to these Abrahamic religions and their immediate predecessors, I shall try as much as is possible to forget about them for the moment, and I'll ask you to do the same if you will. For the next four lectures at least, I shall predominantly use examples from places where the Abrahamic religions have no or only peripheral influence. I shall often turn to a little village in Madagascar where I've been doing field work on and off for 40 years, and which I therefore know fairly well. Um, admittedly, this is a place where Christianity hasn't been present for 50 years at least, but quite unlike what's the case for many other parts of Madagascar, um, Christianity there is, uh, in these other places, Christianity is crucially important, but there Christianity has somehow remained external to the central concerns of the lives of the inhabitants. These first four lectures will therefore consist in a general discussion of certain features of human social organizations in general, though even in this, the word religion will pop up from time to time. The last three, on the other hand, will deal with phenomena for which the English language uh, labeled religion can be used somewhat, but only somewhat, more easily. However, I will try to show that even there, bearing in mind the human-wide aspects of the social which will have been discussed in the previous lectures, these, this perspective changes our understanding that the more usual topics of the anthropology of religion, for example, the relation of religion to the state, the modern transformations of Buddhism and Hinduism in reaction to Christianity and Islam, spirit of possession, the spread of Pentecostalism, Seventh-day Adventism, Prosperity Gospels, and so on. Before starting on this exercise, I think it would be useful to explain the kind of anthropologist I am, or rather the kind of anthropologist I've become. I hope that also that these lectures will give me a chance to understand better the kind of anthropology you are, as I have to admit, I'm fairly ignorant of contemporary German anthropology, so there might be a fair exchange. 
I was probably one of the last British anthropologists to be trained in the four-field approach of anthropology, which combines social and cultural anthropology with prehistory, archaeology, biological anthropology, and linguistics. <coughs> However, like most of my contemporaries, I was uncomfortable with the evolutionary implications of such a discipline and became merely a social anthropologist when that tradition was strong. Uh, in the 1960s, and again like most of my contemporaries, I was influenced by various more cultural approaches such as those of American anthropologists such as Clifford Gates. However, unlike most of my colleagues at the time, I could not obliterate my interest in the non-social cultural anthropological fields. And in any case, other influences made me suspicious of the drift towards particularism and cultural relativism, which has characterized which the social cultural discipline of the Anglo-Saxon variety in the second half of the 20th century, and which continues in many quarters in those branches of anthropology right up to now. These tendencies are anti-naturalist because they, they insist on forgetting the idea that in the end, anthropology of whatever kind is part of the general enterprise of understanding our species Instead, social and cultural anthropology is often reduced to something like area studies. Such a particularist stance leaves me unsatisfied. I'm also unsatisfied with another trend which has made of social anthropology a branch of sociology. That is for different reasons that will become clear as these lectures proceed, when I hope to show that the very idea of the social is much more fundamentally problematic than is usually understood in the sociological disciplines. There were also more positive influences on my work, which brought me back to anthropology as a natural science. These began to re-emerge and for me merge in a way in the later part of the last century. Some of these influences came from politics and the form of renewed Marxism, in part significantly influenced by what became known as the Frankfurt School. Other influences came from within anthropology, in particular the cognitive approach which has always characterized the work of Levi Strauss, uh, was very important for me. Uh, for me, following him, uh, developments which transformed linguistics in the 1960s seem particularly inspiring. A number of linguists, if I can paraphrase it, his talks, changed linguistics from a social science into a natural science, while avoiding the reductionism which, which, which so often haunts these kinds of attempts. Writers such as Chomsky were part of a tradition which saw language in cognitive terms, and Levi Strauss was part of this trend, although not influenced by Chomsky. And his largely unsuccessful and often abandoned attempt to move social and cultural anthropology in the same direction. However, the general, this general direction has become very important for me, particularly significant with development in cognitive science and in the rediscovery of the mind, which promised to offer a non-reductionist, truly historical account of human societies, but yet still viewed these as instances of the natural history of our species. It has seemed to me ever more essential that anthropologists consider the nature of cognitive uh, in their explanations and expositions of culture, even when engaged in work which is largely ethnographic. This is because of any account of motivation, of the storage of knowledge and its organization, 
especially in relation to action, inevitably carries with it great and heavy elements of psychological theories, and these must be examined critically whenever possible. So I have found a combination of theories and data from the cognitive sciences very important in my work. I'm therefore often classed together with a number of anthropologists whose work has become widely known as being part of a movement that is pushing anthropology closer to cognitive science and even perhaps towards evolutionary theory. It sometimes goes with the label of cognitivist as though being interested in cognition was a kind of theory. Putting me together with these anthropologists is not completely wrong, but I'm also rather different from others in this group. I do share that general aim to re-naturalize anthropology and to make our discipline compatible with other natural and social sciences. Such a move is similar to, the, to that argued by Quine for philosophy, who to the horror of many argued that his discipline should not be anything other than a natural science. However, I also want to distinguish myself, to distinguish what I do, from other anthropologists who could be claimed together with me, uh, who could be classed together with me, such as Sperber, Boyer, or Whitehouse. The difference is first of all probably due to the fact that I've remained closer to the inheritance of the anthropology in which I was brought up, and they have. Two aspects of this are crucial for me. One is methodological, the other theoretical, although actually the two are linked. I am an unashamed advocate of what Malinowski called participant observation. It does not matter to me whether he was a particularly good practitioner uh, of what he preached. What I mean by participant observation is long-term immersion in a very different culture to one's own, where one communicates with the language of the people studying and with whom one lives on a daily basis. This immersion involves a repeated, continual contact, above all, in everyday activities. There are many real grave problems of a personal, of a moral, and of a scientific kind involved in this kind of research. These have been rehearsed again and again. But the value of such a research is often, is not, is often less stressed. What I would argue is its greatest strength is that the knowledge of the people we study exists and therefore can only be studied in practice. This is because it is largely inexplicit and furthermore it cannot be explicated by those involved uh, whom, for example, when, for example, the era asked about it by a researcher. This is because of its in and for practice character and not uh, normally made a discursive uh, exposition. This fact rules out for me a primary reliance by the anthropologist on interview methods. The only way in which this practice-based implicit culture can be communicated is through joint participation, which implies mutual learning. Then the anthropologist can discover this knowledge, this knowledge he studies in others, in him or herself, by a kind of theoretical introspection. What I mean by theoretical introspection is an examination of what one knows and has learned from participation, but in the light of general theoretical uh, questions and general anthropological sophistication which comes from the scientific practice of general anthropology, cognitive science, or perhaps sociology, something that one's informants, however well-intentioned they are, cannot do 
They're not anthropologists. They're in the business of living their lives, like most of us are most of the time. Um, such a general method also throws into doubt the, an exclusive reliance on experimental methods which have been imported from such disciplines as psychology, since these are also these also are subject to show their knowledge explicitly. This does not mean, however, that such methods cannot be an important adjunct to parts of conservation, and that includes uh, interview methods. This brings me to a second difference from others who, like me, are uh, often considered cognitive anthropologists. Our theoretical anchoring is very different, mine and theirs. The writers I have just mentioned start from hypotheses generated from general considerations about human uh, evolution, often formulated by evolutionary psychologists or philosophers in a Western scientific context. These scholars then look for evidence to support these hypotheses in the societies and cultures which exist or have existed around the world, and which to them are thus a kind of laboratory. Even those who have a background in, in social or cultural anthropology tend to adopt the tag, this tag, and it is a fact that as a result they have drifted away from the study of particular ethnographic cases. I, on the other hand, want to maintain a double level. One side of which is, um, is, not, is not all that different from that of the authors I have just mentioned. But the other side uh, maintains an anchoring in the place study. The kind of anchor, this kind of anchoring that participant observation creates. The kind of anthropology I practice, therefore, involves a toing and froing from fieldwork to theoretical reflection, informed by developments in discipline. Much of my work is anthropological theory, but it also involves going back regularly to that small village I mentioned in the forest region of Madagascar. Though recently, I have to admit, these returns have been much shorter than before. Um, this is going back to people I know well, who in many cases I have known and who have known me for most of my and their lives. I shall be there again this October. I was there two years ago. I find the maintenance of this continual contact essential and characteristic of anthropology uh, and one of its greatest strengths. A core value of our discipline is that it brings us back with, fam uh, with familiar contemporaries in very different places than those we usually live with. This forces us not to forget the complexity of our species. As human beings, we are the product of both of unique historical circumstances and of more general human-wide processes, including cognitive processes. I'm well aware that attempting to understand such a combination is difficult and unpopular. Unpopular among social and cultural anthropologists who are suspicious, even allergic, uh, of a natural science approach, in part because uh, the troubled history of our discipline reminds us of appalling crimes which have been legitimated by this type of argument. Um, unpopular amongst natural scientists and people who've been called cognitivists, because they usually refer the full implications of human history and because they are often appalled by what they see as the sloppiness of the methods and theories uh, which are used.
by social and cultural anthropologists. I admit the kind of dual anchorage I intend is difficult, and I shall explain it in a few words now and return to it more fully in subsequent lectures. It is based on the notion of human beings being caught in a single process, which, lead, which is made up of apparently different kinds of processes of very different nature. I think of human beings and myself in the process of evolutionary and physical change, in the, process of the, uh, in the processes of the body and the mind. Nothing is outside the evolutionary processes. But also nothing for human beings is outside the process of history with its extraordinary complexity and finally in the process of the transformations of the environment in which human beings live. The unity of these different processes uh, means, all, uh, means all sorts of interaction. History has continually modified our physiology and our reproductive mechanisms by such things as medicines, new reproductive technologies, sewers and childcare techniques. There is therefore almost no human behaviour that is simply biological, hardwired, or whatever you want to call it. But also, there is no human behavior which is not constituted by biological interactions such as um, and, uh, such as sheep, flu viruses, or plants. There is no environment that is not modified by humans and by history. There is nothing that is simply biological, cultural, or environmental. There is nothing that is not biological, historical, or environmental at the same time. When the continual return of what the continual re return of fieldwork does, um, and that is especially so for fieldwork in exotic location, locations, is that it reminds me of the complexity and of the and the reality of this continuous uh, and many processes within a single process. This is what I believe anthropologists should never escape from completely. That is, bearing in mind uh, particular or, um, ethnographic situations. Any human schema which, which refuses the effort uh, of, at the very least, not being uh, not losing sight of the fact of combination and co concentrating on one process within the, the, the human pro uh, phenomena and thinking about it as though it, is in, it, uh, it was independent will go wrong. I think the danger of losing sight of the complex unity of what we study always threatens particular uh, particularist social and cultural anthropology as it equally threatens certain naturalist, reductionist theories. We can easily stop being anthropologists by becoming either historians or human biologists. This is why I engaged in the toing and froing I mentioned. I will be doing this toing and froing in these lectures, and now I will try to convince you that, uh, of the value of such an awkward stance. The dangers of forgetting that we are studying that what we are studying is actually uh, is actually like is really is very real. I'm struck how in my theoretical thinking, and particularly in that of my uh, in, in some of my, of my colleagues, the complexity and subtlety that I have got to know in interaction with others in the field. Uh, becomes so easily mythologized and transformed in my head as time passes away from the field, so that I feel I need regularly uh, doses of de-intoxication 
uh, which uh, actually going back creates, as it dispels, um, falsely real, over simple theoretical propositions. For me, um, this kind of anthropology is therefore a discipline in all senses of the term. And because of its odd and awkward character, it adds a valuable and unique contribution to the other sciences involved in understanding our species. To give you some idea of what this toing and froing means, I shall introduce what I shall argue is involved, but not limited to the phenomena and the, uh, to the phenomena that have been called religious, but which, as I said, are no way specific to it. The development of the argument I outline here will occupy the following lectures. But since I know that many of you will not be able to attend these, I'll just give you a kind of preview or taste of my argument. Again, let me start by contrasting my position with the more common ones. Religion has been variously defined most usually in terms of its involvement with supernatural entities or in relation to faith, which I take to mean beliefs not based on ordinary forms of reason. By supernatural entities or faith is meant belief in the existence of beings which seem in some ways or many ways not to be ordinary laws of causality, time or space. I'm not concerned whether this is an adequate definition, because to argue whether it is right or wrong would again involve me in doing what I don't want to do, specify what kind of natural phenomena religion may be. Instead, I'm concerned with the implication involved in such definitions, what one might call its reverse side. This is the implicit proposition that Ordinary, ordinary social life is uh, the non-religious, uh, the ordinary social life, and the non-religious, however defined, is quite straightforward, secular, and can be explained in terms of well-understood intuitive principles of causation. That, in other words, that what we do when we are not involved in religion is simply being involved in a rational calculation. However, if that is not the case, if, if the non-religious is not straightforward, if normal human life is not a transparently intuitive affair, if we found just as much of the characteristics that have been used to define religion in phenomena we would never dream of calling religion, then counterintuitive beliefs would not in the law identify religion, nor indeed the other things which have been linked with it. The very notion of religion as something distinctive obviously would disappear. Uh, in other words, I'm going to argue about non-religion uh, as a way of dissolving religion. This, um, I shall propose that those features which have been misleadingly used to characterize religion are general and typical of certain general necessary aspects of social life. What I'll argue is that phenomena which are central to the way we conduct many, many aspects of our lives turn out on, exam on examination to completely escape what could be called the secular rational. This, of course, does not mean that their experience as such, actually experiencing them as such, may be a recent development of what has been called modernity. Modernity. Normally, we just get on with things. And however central these inst institutions might be, we do not engage in an analytic scrutiny of their foundation. I think if we did, we would soon be in trouble in the UN. Let me first of all 
uh, by way of introduction, borrowed two familiar topics used by the philosopher Sir, whose argument is a little similar to mine, although the significance he attributes to these examples is ultimately <coughs> different. The examples of marriage and money. Marriage in Europe has traditionally been seen as one of the building blocks of society. Conservative politicians love to say this. Yet, on examination, it turns out to be very difficult uh, to pinpoint what kind of phenomenon is involved. We know that marriage is not created by the fact that two people like each other, or have sex together, or have children. <coughs> it's quite possible for people to be married, who hate each other, have no children, nor ever engage in sex. So instead, Searle pays particular attention to the fact that in Western societies, for two people to be considered married, what is essential is that an official of some kind, civil or religious, has spoken a phrase or a number of phrases of the kind, I hereby declare you man and wife, then you're married. Why such a speech act causes such an effect is very mysterious, yet most of the time we assume it does and we're able to get on with our lives assuming that what is involved is quite straightforward. Money is another well-known example of the kind of mystery by which we allow our lives to be regulated by. We all use it, and normally it seems quite obvious why it can do what it does, why it can compel others to perform services for us, or make others give us certain goods how it can be a store of value, even if hidden under a mattress. Yet the empirical stuff, when it takes a material form, it doesn't even need to do this, it's quite remote from any obvious cause that might normally account for such effects. Money can thus be called, if you like, supernatural, though it's not normally experienced as such, or the mere convention standing for something else. It can take the forms of bits of paper or metal, which it's difficult to understand, can have such powerful effects, but which are take, normally taken for granted. Indeed, now, during most of the time, it doesn't even have this support and exists in invisible and even more mysterious forms. Money like marriage, means that we live suspended in the non-empirical and that we are at ease with this suspension. Money and marriage for most of us, most of the time, a supernatural phenomenon whose existence we do not experience as supernatural. What this means at the very least is that what has been called religion does not have a monopoly of the supernatural. It is not a privileged locus of distinctive phenomena. We're always performing miracles and talking to immaterial entities and seeing further than we can see. These two examples, however, are mere manifestations of a much more fundamental characteristic of human sociality. The example of marriage is difficult to pin down because it is merely a node in a set of equally mysterious entities. Wives, husbands, remember I mentioned marriage, uh, priests, mayors, uh, and it doesn't stop there. Priests imply congregations, husbands imply parents-in-law, and possibly daughters and sons. Mayors imply constituencies and constituents. These entities they're not people, but they're people like. What does the husband bit of a husband look like without the people concerned? Where is it located? I will argue that husbandhood is 
also invisible, transcendental, yet it seems very real to most of us. The ontology of, this, of the system by which all these entities are a part is mysterious. Money at first seems very different since it does normally have a material constituent, but actually it too exists in terms of complex social relations, which again are mysterious in themselves. Uh, again, again, it is social, it is the social without real people, the social that seems very remote and the complex and fluid flow of people interacting together. These are familiar uh, phenomena. So in order to advance my argument, I'll take you back to the Malagasy village, which I've studied for a long time, though not in any detail. One could look at this village uh, as if from the outside, where, and, and its people, rather like a fish demographer, could look uh, at the social organization of a show of fish paying no attention to the intentionality of individuals. We would, we would then see a continually modifying and fluid maelstrom of interactions of people uh, coming close to each other in a way perhaps touching each other from time to time. Probably the fish demographer would then note statistically recurring patterns, but these would have nothing to do with any intentional action on the part of the fish. If we had an anthropologist who looked at the village like that, then he could see the villagers <coughs> interacting in the same sort of way. Then we could come a bit closer and we could see the multitude of actions and interactions that bring about these patterns. We would then imagine in ourselves intentionalities that modify, that motivate at least some of those interact, of these actions and interactions. We would be basing ourselves on our assumptions of what are universal human motives. This would be to a certain, this would be right to a certain extent. And it would certainly seem uh, um, reasonable because we share so much as human beings with other people however remote in time they are often uh, from us in time or space. On such, a base, on such a basis, we would be right to a certain extent. We would understand why different people cooperate in carrying a large log. We could understand even much of the intentionalities of a group of people gossiping together in the sun and joking together. We would understand much of what is going on when people cook a meal and eat together. It would be difficult to see uh, much pattern if we limited ourselves to this level, since these micro-interactions would be incredibly complex and fluid as people come and go, plan and plot, joke and inform each other, but patterns would emerge. These patterns would be understood to be produced by the sum total of individually motivated actions. The model would then be rather like the model of the classical economists who believe that the economy, or perhaps moving to society, was the sum total of individuals maximizing profit uh, or maximizing some other form of satisfaction. This would be a theory based on, on simple belief desire psychology. I've called this uh, kind of analysis the transactional level because it is very real, though only a part of the way the social works in a Malagasy video. Interestingly, it's also the way many natural scientists tend to explain things when they turn to looking at people after having studied other animal species. They too assume that people see the world as it is and choose to maximize their choices, usually simply to their own advantage. This was and is the perspective of the sociobiologists. They note 
how human society is very much more complex than the society of other species, and there are reason that this places great cognitive domain problems on, on the brain of the individual. This is the, um, but they are actually arguing that human society is just a more complex form of society than, um, than the other animal societies. Well, what I shall be arguing is that there is a difference in kind. This becomes clear when I think again of the Malagasy village. What is missing in the transactionalist view of the social is an element that is not instant based. This is the flow of intentions and interactions that that approach emphasizes. In this perspective, nothing is stable and everything is continually open for negotiations and renegotiations. And whatever regularities can be detected and isolated, or only statistical regularities captured in a snapshot taken from the continual transformative flows. This misses out much more stable parameters of a quite different sort, which mean uh, merely looking at maximizing in the short term, which merely looking at maximizing in the short term fails to bring to light. Uh, in any case, the fluid transactionalist picture of society is not the only one and not even the main one which the villages themselves <coughs> used to organize. Explain the organization of the village. I'm going on rather long. How, how long do you think would be reasonable to and I, I'll summarize just the end? Um, well, let me go very quickly, because I think I've given you hints of where I'm going. What I'm basically saying is that um, the very idea of roles and of groups which are stable in time, because these, these are things which are thought of as stable in time, means that they, are, they can only have an indirect relationship with actual people who are transformative beings, who are changing from moment to moment, both in their bodies and their own interrelationship. So therefore, human beings involve people-like phenomena which can only fully exist in imagination. The reason why they can only fully exist in imagination is because of their stability. And they can only refer to unstable beings like ourselves very, very indirectly. And therefore saying that all the mysterious things which have been attributed to religion are actually present in the phenomena of groups and roles uh, as we know them in the social. If the relationship between actual people moving around, changing, whose bodies continually changing, who are having uh, a variety of relationships with others, is very remote from the roles which they can be thought to have, if uh, husbandhood has to be mysterious because it's stable, or wifehood is, it has to be mysterious because it's stable, while it's, it, it refers to unstable, continually modifying people, then that system is imaginary, just as just as uh, only has a very distant relationship to actual people. In other words, a lot of our social life is, is, a, is, a, is an imaginary matter of entities which have a very indirect relationship uh, with, with, with people. If that is so, there is a sense in which we're never in the secular. And therefore, if we're never in the secular, the notion of religion disappears. And there's another aspect to it, which is what I will finish with. If that is so, then phenomena which we would normally think of as the religious 
turned out to be a politician, but he became, as he was old, he, he, an established elder. An established elder who was uh, greatly feared because of the possibility of his curse, very much courted as an elder because uh, he was going to be a sort of, he was a source of blessing for all kinds of things. But he himself, by the time I, uh, I was referring to him, was a senile old man. He was, everybody knew, pretty useless. He stank, he would sit there in the corner and hardly ever said anything. So in other words, the point I'm trying to make is the relationship between him as an elder, that extremely powerful person within a complicated system, and the actual person sitting there uh, in, a, in, in a terrible state, was very obvious to him. He was completely double. What relationship there was between him sitting there and his role as an elder, a source of blessing, a source of curses, was very, very distant. Notice we haven't yet moved in anything which is straightforwardly religious. But on the other hand, in that village, people continually pray, give food to ancestors. Now, these ancestors are mainly sources of blessing and of curse. They are being asked exactly the same thing and are being feared for exactly the same thing as this living elder. Yet, they are completely dead. But I, what I want to suggest is that actually the remote, the, the relationship between them as ancestors and them as dead bodies is just as distant as the relationship between this living elder in his decrepit state and his role as an elder. In other words, there's no real difference between a phenomenon that anthropologists would have called ancestor worship and something which we could have called part of the social organization. And indeed, both the ancestors and the elders are part of the same system and are thought of as part of the same system. As are the children of the elders, the other members of the everybody else in the village who stand in terms of brother-in-law, son-in-law, uh, child, grandchild, great-grandchild, and so on. They all form one social system which includes, without any problem, the dead ancestors. The reason why it includes them without any problem is because the, the, the ontologically the same problem exists in matching this uh, old man to this role of elders, as exists in matching a dead body to an ancestor who is worshipped. If that is so, phenomena which we would normally call social, the kinship system, because that's really what I'm talking about, is just as non-secular as phenomena that would normally in the anthropological literature be called um, religious. And that is going to be the basis of what I'll be arguing in the further lecture.